Hello, hello everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. And I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our latest edition of the State of the Consumer webinar. This is Super Bowl week, as you can tell, me wearing my jersey of my beloved Philadelphia Eagles, who unfortunately will not be in the big game this year. They were in 2018, though, and they beat the New England Patriots, in case you didn't remember, but they won't be in this year. But it's Super Bowl week. It's also the week uh, that the Winter Olympic Games um, have opened up in Beijing. So lots going on in the sporting world. It's the sporting world, like so many industries, have been through so much turmoil since the onset of the pandemic. And we thought, given the week and the times that we're in right now, it made sense to really dive deep into sports. What are sports impacts on, on brands? What's the impact of things like fantasy sports and online gaming um, on, on sports? And what does it all mean for, for brands who so many rely on sports to activate their brand in front of live audiences to really drive revenue for their business? So this is going to be a fun one. We have an incredible group of guests uh, today uh, and so thankful that we were able to bring such a great group together. And we're going to dive in. So it should be a really exciting one. We're going to have plenty of time at the end for people who know much more about this topic than me uh, to chime in um, on all the topics I just discussed. We are going to be reviewing the results of a just recently released study that we did here at Suzy um, from January 1st to 13th with a sample size of 1,000 American sports fans. And as always, the sample size of a study is directly representative of U.S. consumers and a census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So uh, I'm really excited to dive in and coming up, uh, our special guest, we have Paul Alexander, who's a CMO of the Crestum School of Business at Boston University. My good friend, Dehani Jones, entrepreneur, former NFL player and former Philadelphia Eagle, as well as former Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, and Cincinnati Bengals are, of course, in the upcoming Super Bowl this Sunday. And Jolie Levin, who has a ton to say. Uh, she's the head of sports partnerships at Mediacom. So cannot wait to bring on our STEAM uh, panel later on. But first, we're going to dive into some of the insights we've uncovered uh, on this topic, of course, using our Suzy tool. And for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform. We service large enterprises, um, essentially empowering them to put the voice of the consumer at your fingertips. So if you'd like to learn more about Suzy, uh, feel free to reach us out to us at suzy.com um, or at suzybiz on Twitter, and we'll make sure that we connect you with the right person at our organization. So it's finally time for sports fans uh, to rejoice. It, it's sports is really um, in its peak season right now. We have the Super Bowl. We have the Olympics. Uh, we're in the heart of the NBA season. Um, we've been through a rocky road as sports fans over the last couple of years. I should say I'm a huge sports fan, especially NFL and NBA. Um, and it feels like sports is really getting exciting again. Um, the Super Bowl is upon us. Uh, you know, the, the Super Bowl ad market is on fire. Super Bowl ads are going for as much as $7 million, uh, which is a record. There's already a ton of uh, buzz for brands that are participating um, in the big game. And the Olympics are happening. And, and the Olympics, there's slightly less buzz, we should say, um, about the Olympics. The Olympics has been hit pretty hard. We had the summer games where there were no spectators involved. We had the winter games where there's limited spectators involved. Um, we have a lot of consumers that we're hearing from that are saying it's hard to find out where to watch the game, where to stream the games um, on the variety of, of different uh, streaming platforms it's on. Uh, there is a lack of, of stars right now in the Olympics, which is definitely something that takes away, I think, from a lot of the appeal, especially for younger viewers. So we'll talk about the Olympics and, and how fandom, um, you know, is really impacted by all the changes that have occurred uh, in the Olympic Games. So the things that we're going to be talking about today are really three core areas until, of course, we bring on our guests. First and foremost, what does it mean to be a fan today with all the changes uh, that the sports world have seen? How has COVID impacted fandom overall? And what do really fans want to see this year, both with the Olympic Games, um, the Super Bowl, and moving forward um, as we, get, as we you know, further out, have things like uh, the NBA Finals, the start of the Major League Baseball season, etc. So first and foremost, what does being a sports fan mean today? Well, first and foremost, through our research, we learned that not all fans are alike. Um, you know, 29% of consumers would call themselves occasional fans, 50% average fans, and the top 20% call themselves extreme fans, people who would, for instance, wear a sports jersey during a webinar. So, um, you know, uh, certainly you can't look at 
the sports market as a monolithic market and fandom is monolithic, but uh, certainly you do have uh, no shortage of both extreme and, and average fans who are interested um, in a variety of different sports and the players uh, within it. Um, 75%, three quarters, do consider themselves to be a sports fan uh, when defined as a sports fan. And we asked people, you know, what does a sports fan mean for you? And we, this was interesting to pull down. Being a fan for me means being on the lookout for every game and not missing it for anything in the world. So, you know, these extreme fans, they can't get enough of it. And the streaming world, while it has posed its set of issues on linear broadcast networks, has really opened up sort of a world of opportunity for sports fans where on any given night you have limitless options to tune into the team and the sport that matters most to you. Uh, like many of you probably tuning into this webinar right now, it used to be impossible to see a, a team that was out of market or see your alma mater college play um, football or, or basketball if they weren't a major market team. But now there's, there's so many packages that you can sign up for, um, you know, directly to allow you to stream any, any team that matters to you, it really is an incredible time to be a sports fan. Um, what's interesting with the younger generation is that over half of sports fans in the U.S. say they prefer watching highlights to full games. TikTok, um, most recently, and before that, Twitter and, and, and certainly Facebook, have had a big role in that, where you do have younger fans right now um, less focused on watching full games, especially in, in sports like Major League Baseball where the, the, the speed of the game um, has really pushed away many fans from wanting to watch a full two and a half hour game in a world that's built for the flick and, and consumers really wanting to have you know, the highlights and the shareable moments. So many of the younger fans are growing up with the notion that I don't need to watch a full game. I just need to you know, be in touch with the highlights, the, the plays that matter in real time. And that can kind of fulfill my need as a sports fan where I think older fans are, are into consuming sports in the more traditional sense of watching full games. So it's just something to, to watch out for. And I think there's been many brands that have taken a full you know, advantage of it, as you see, um, you know, platforms on social media like House of Highlights uh, that have exploded in popularity uh, just from the notion that this is what the new fam wants. They want short form, built for the flick, sports highlights versus consuming uh, these full games. Um, both Super Bowl and the Olympics um, did suffer in uh, TV viewership in 2021, as did, uh, you know, the NBA. Um, the 2021 Super Bowl, which was last year's Super Bowl, uh, posted the lowest viewership ratings uh, since 2007. And that was despite the fact that Tom Brady um, was in the game. Um, and the Tokyo Games uh, were the least watched Olympics ever for NBC. Um, they were really, you know, quite, it was quite a disaster in terms of viewership both because of the timing of the Olympics and the fact that fans weren't involved, uh, you know, really involved. And also, if you look back to the past summer, it was right when it was it was in between the gap of when the first COVID surge started and the Delta variant really took off. And meant most consumers did not want to sit home in the summer and watch the Olympics. So the timing uh, was definitely unfortunate for the Summer Olympics, but it does seem the Winter Olympics you know, isn't really picking up to that degree either. So I think the Olympic sign we'll talk about again in terms of the challenges that it has with attracting uh, the American sports fan. However, while, while these platforms really struggled in linear TV viewership, you are finding this shift to streaming. Um, the Super Bowl was the most streamed NFL game ever. And as I mentioned, not only are more people watching games over streaming more and more consumers are streaming highlights and interacting with the games engaging um, in different ways and more fans never also connected to the olympic games um, in some ways just the variety of sports um, and the different time zones that, that they're being streamed on makes makes you know connecting digitally to the olympics a far more enjoyable and engaging experience for consumers than through traditional linear television um, brands are taking note of this. They're seeing how consumers are shifting their viewing habits. New brands like State Farm picking TikTok over TV. Um, so while on one hand you are seeing uh, you know Super Bowl ads selling out, you are also seeing other brands who traditionally have been involved in the Super Bowl say, "How can we look at you know a different way of reaching fans?" Um, Coca Cola, the same thing. Um, you know, they're skipping TV marketing for the, both the Beijing Olympic Games and the Super Bowl um, and really focusing on platforms like gaming and social media. So you are seeing brands start to take note that maybe just buying that 30 second spot isn't the best way to kind of connect with sports fans. 
But TV is certainly not obsolete. Uh, nearly 60% of sports fans report spending more time watching games live compared to reliving the moments through social media. So the question becomes, well, what's the juxtaposition here? On one hand, the viewership's down. On the other hand, 60% of consumers are saying they're spending more time watching the games live. And that is really where the confusion of streaming comes in. It used to be so much easier when you know, Fox was the only place that you can watch the Super Bowl um, or NBC was the only place, that one channel where you can watch the Olympics, where now you have Peacock streaming the Olympics through all their affiliates and their streaming platform. And it becomes a little bit more convoluted, um, both for the consumer and for the business's ability to measure the efficacy of these large scale sporting events. Um, however, make no mistake about it, live sports is really the game for brands. Um, speaking for myself personally, live sports is the only time I ever see TV commercials. Everything else I watch on television is streamed and time shifted, whether it's my favorite shows. Um, you know, obviously, like many others, I watch shows like Billions or Succession or whatever it may be. And, and those are just you know, paid platforms where I don't get exposed to TV spots. But if I'm watching a show like This Is Us, which is one of my favorites on NBC, I'm likely time shifting it and, and sometimes skipping over, always skipping over the commercials. The only place I'm not doing that is when I'm watching a live game. I, I do, do not want to be time shifted on a live game. Uh, during a live game, I don't want to go on Twitter and find out someone scored because, you know, I'm, I'm basically trying to skip around or pause so I don't need to watch all the TV spots. Um, and for that reason, the NFL indeed made up 75 out of the top 100 most watch U.S. broadcasts in 2021. So think about that for a second. Out of everything that's on uh, television, three quarters of the most watched shows are NFL games. It's not just the Super Bowl. It's not just the playoffs. It's Sunday night football. It's Monday night football. It's Thursday night football. Um, so the NFL really does control in a lot, a lot of ways television broadcast media. And where the NFL goes is where the eyeballs go and where the brands will want to go. And I should mention, this isn't just amongst male viewers, but it's also amongst female viewers. So when the NFL starts to, re as you're doing right now, renegotiating their rights because they had, they've had a um, decades-long uh, partnership with DirecTV, which was uh, acquired then by AT&T, where the only way that you can get the NFL package uh, was from DirecTV Sunday Ticket. Now... You know, you st you're starting to see some of the tech platforms creep in. Amazon got the rights to Thursday Night Football. Um, there's talk about companies like Google and Microsoft and, and even Facebook trying to pony up um, dollars to the NFL so they can have exclusive broadcast rights um, for either one sliver of games or, or, or a conference or a team or whatever you may be. And this is going to change the game because it's going to turn more and more, if not all of football viewing, um, to streaming. And, and while right now a lot of brands are having a hard time measuring the impact of streaming, there are certainly a lot of innovations that are going on right now to track the efficacy of and, and viewership of streaming program, programming, um, which is going to make this a more, I think, even more enticing buy for, for broadcasters uh, and, and, and brands that want to kind of go and, and juxtapose their, their commercial footage against uh, these games in a variety of different formats. Another huge part of fandom is apparel and merchandise. Um, being a fan, you know, means you support your teams that you follow and you're buying the t-shirts or hats um, or jerseys uh, to show your support. Um, Fanatics, which is um, an incredible e-commerce company, which really has cornered the market on sports apparel, um, has just recently been valued at $15 billion. What they did was a brilliant strategy, which essentially they Amazon proof their business, where if you want to buy a new jersey from your favorite team, more often than not, the only place we can get that jersey is over Fanatics, given uh, the exclusive rights that they were able to negotiate with the leagues and the teams, not just pro, but also college. Um, and merchandise continues to grow, um, you know, in popularity. Um, sports fans spend more merchandise actually than they do on tickets. 24% um, um, of, of the fans that we surveyed said they spend the most money on merchandise, um, more than tickets for the actual game. I'm sure that COVID had a big impact on that, as for many sports, buying tickets to games and sometimes wasn't even really possible. Um, and it's really consistent across uh, both, both genders. Um, and even extreme sports fans are spending as much on merchandise as they do on game tickets. So merch is a huge business um, and it's a huge opportunity um, for companies that are, are in the apparel space. 
And as you can see, the, the total revenue just continues to grow uh, for merchandise. Um, Phantom is also not a one-way street. Um, the extreme sports fans really want to give back to the club because they feel like it gives them so much. So, you know, they're buying merchandise. They're trying to support the teams in a lot of different ways because in a lot of ways, fandom is you feel like you're a part of the team. You know, you ride or die with that team. So if that team needs support, especially during times of COVID, you're going to want to find different ways uh, to support them. However, loyalty is imperative, but it's not conditional. Being a sports fan means you're there for your team, uh, both through the good and the bad times. Um, this is really interesting that fans of less successful football clubs are more loyal to one another. Um, so you see teams like the Bengals, which until this year had not won a playoff game, I think for 25 or 30 years. And now all of a sudden they find themselves in the Super Bowl. And that's where you have really the super fans come out. You saw that with the Chicago Cubs. You saw that with uh, the Boston Red Sox. You saw that with my very own Philadelphia Eagles who weren't, um, who hadn't won a Super Bowl ever. Um, and then here they are in, in 2018 competing against Tom Brady for the Super Bowl. And that's where you see the loyal fans come out and talk about people spending during that time. They'll spend anything to support their fans. In fact, when I was at the Super Bowl, when the Eagles played, the gentleman in front of me, literally told me he took out a second mortgage on his home to be able to pay for Super Bowl tickets. So if that doesn't show you the power of fandom in sports, um, I don't know what does. Um, however, over 50% of people said they would change their sports team across all levels of fandom. And that is really this kind of new era of sports consumption kind of creeping in. It used to be people supported the jersey. They didn't really care who was in that jersey that jersey was what they cared about. Um, and now people are supporting more the number on the jersey in terms of the players that they follow. And in this new sports world, people are jumping around more so. And the next level of that is not just not only supporting the jersey or the player, they're supporting who's on their fantasy football team or they're supporting who they gambled on that night. And because of that, the, the very nature of fandom is definitely shifting. Um, younger fans tend to be the least loyal. Um, but fans loyalty can be tested across all ages. Um, you know, the, the older consumers get, um, in some ways, the less likely they are the shift. But younger consumers, um, you know, have a lot of different, uh, you know, flex points when it comes to how long am I going to really support that team? Um, and that's really interesting when you look at opportunities for bringing new fans into the sport, whether it's for selling merchandise or activating brands across teams. So fans are willing to switch teams if players move teams. We talked about people like Tom Brady when he switched from the New England Patriots to Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A lot of fans definitely went along with him. So you, you have seen that happen throughout the history of sports. LeBron James is a perfect example where his fans followed him from Cleveland um, down to Miami when, when he relocated to the Miami Heat. And of course, now to the Los Angeles Lakers, he's brought a lot of fans with him and a lot of popularity. Um, and with LeBron goes the sales of jerseys, the increased price of tickets to games, et cetera. Um, if people move to a new city, they're likely to switch teams as well as if they have new friend and family affiliations. If you marry somebody who's a diehard fan of a certain sport, there's a good chance that over time you're going to be swayed to like that sport as well. So we mentioned fantasy sports and fantasy sports, especially as it relates to football, has been a huge catalyst for bringing casual fans more into the fold. Um, it's almost as if every company, every office, every group of friends is using fantasy sports as a way to keep connected, to be able to, be able to give each other jabs and to feel some type of skin in the game. Um, and for years and years, fantasy sports has continued to grow in popularity. And that's another reason why um, people are less likely to support a team because they're really supporting who's on their fantasy team, because that's who they really feel the most kind of fandom and ownership towards. And then as of late, in the last couple of years, the sports world has been transformed by legalized sports betting. Um, this is something I was talking about really when the pandemic first hit in March 2020, that I thought there was going to be an onslaught of new regulation to legalize sports gambling for the main reason that sports gambling is heavily taxed. And many municipalities are in dire need of funds um, to support basic infrastructure as, you know, sales tax revenue has gone down um, during the pandemic. And, you know, uh, 
sports betting was the perfect cure for that. Most recently in, in the month of January, sports betting was legalized in New York. And I can tell you that when you're watching games, not only are you seeing commercials for these sports betting platforms like DraftKings and FanDuel, one out of every two or three commercials, you're actually seeing interstitials of these logos on during the game. You're seeing ESPN now uh, show the, the, the lines of games uh, while they're showing highlights. So it went from being something that was quite taboo, looking back to the days of Pete Rose getting banned for gambling on other teams, um, to now, you know, there being a team, an NFL team in Las Vegas, um, and to now the NFL looking to partner with some of these platforms. So we have done a 360, um, you know, as a, a 180 rather, um, you know, as a, as a industry in the sports industry of going from pushing away sports gambling to actually embracing it as a growth driver. And the, the onslaught of sports gambling options obviously is rife with risk for some consumers that don't know how to handle uh, their gambling, but also brings opportunities um, to bring more people into the sport. Uh, so more and more dollars are certainly going uh, towards the Super Bowl and I'm calling it right now that this Super Bowl will be the most gambled on Super Bowl of all time, just given the ease of accessibility of gambling um, to the everyday consumers, because all you need to do is download an app on your phone. So has COVID changed people's experience of being a sports fan? Um, well, people um, since COVID, people are investing more time into sports fandom, um, mostly because they've had more free time. Um, and in, in many ways, especially during, you know, the darkest moments of the pandemic, it did instill a sense of hope. I mean, I remember when the NBA made the decision to play in the bubble in Orlando um, for, you know, an extended end of season and playoffs. I, you know, that got me personally through a lot of really tough times and a lot of other people where you felt so disconnected. There was no live sports. And all of a sudden, even though there were fanless games and there was those weird um, live videos of fans that were on like a Zoom like interface, um, you know, it still made you feel like that there was a world out there again that you could someday uh, be in touch with. And I think in that regard, the NFL did really instill a sense of hope um, for for fans during the, the pandemic. Um 22% of people are spending a lot more time watching games um, and 20% and are spending a lot more time engaging as a fan, again, given that they have more free time. And we've seen that play out, obviously, with the growth of so many new streaming platforms and, you know, people having less to do. And hopefully we're ending the, entering the end of this phase, the beginning of the end of the pandemic. Who knows? I've said that about 10 times over the last uh, two years, uh, but hopefully we are entering the, the end of this where people will start to get out again and maybe spend less time watching games and more time playing games or going to games um, in person. Um, right now, few and half of Americans feel comfortable attending sports in person. So despite the fact that, uh, you know, many stadiums are open, some stadiums are not even requiring consumers to be vaccinated or fans to be vaccinated to enter, you still have um, just less than half of Americans, you know, not feeling comfortable attending sports in person. Uh, so looking ahead, what does this mean for the upcoming um, Olympics and Super Bowl? Um, well, one thing we're, we do see, and we see this in all research, certainly played out uh, during the election and polling, is that there's definitely a divide on what people say and what they do. Um, you know, a lot of this is due to the politicization of the pandemic. Um, last year, a record 72% of people said they didn't plan on hosting a Super Bowl party, for example. So you had nearly three quarters of consumers saying, I'm not going to host or I'm not going to attend a Super Bowl party, yet Super Bowl party food was more popular than ever. Um, last year, Americans ate a record of 1.42 billion chicken wings uh, during Super Bowl Sunday. So unless they're doing that all on their own, um, sat on their couch by themselves, it probably stands the reason that there were more parties than consumers said they were going to have. Now, this year is a different year um, because I think the fear around COVID is certainly less than it was a year ago. But now, you know, less than 10 percent of people saying that we're going to plan or, or hosting or viewing a Super Bowl party. Yet we're having indications that consumers are going to be acting differently. So we always need to be a little bit cognizant of, um, especially in political issues or politically related issues, um, where consumers are worried about the signaling of saying they're going to be getting people together because they don't want to be looked upon negatively, um, even though our research that we conduct on Susie is completely anonymous. Um, and also you have fans 
being restricted from events, which is sending mixed signals to consumers. Um, you know, the, there's huge restrictions right now in Beijing around the Winter Olympics. So you're still tuning into large scale sporting events and seeing empty seats and consumers not being allowed in there. Um, which is which is something that hopefully we'll never see again after this Olympics, but um, it certainly has changed things. So moving forward about the Super Bowl, you have 40% of people feeling excited for the Super Bowl and happy and slightly less for the Olympics. Um, I think the Olympics for me is just a great global gathering. I personally don't consume the Olympics nearly like I do the NFL, but I think the spectacle of bringing the best athletes together from around the world is something to, uh, to, to admire and look at. So to wrap things up, uh, when decide for brands, when deciding on the kind of messaging you want to convey, you obviously have to think carefully about who the audience is, what the insight is, obviously the segment of the brands. But ultimately, what we found through our research across the board is, first and foremost, fans want to be entertained. Um, you know, that nobody wants to see a negative ad. A couple of years ago, there were uh, some ads that I can't even remember the brands, and that probably makes my point for me. Uh, but you know, they were kind of downer ads and they were covering really important issues, but people don't want to be brought to a sad place. They want to laugh and they want to be happy during the Super Bowl. So, you know, expect to see less negative ads and hopefully more, more ads that keep it light and funny. Um, fans definitely want to be acknowledged by brands. So anything that fans can relate to that acknowledges them, um, that, that supports their fandom are things that fans are going to want to support because it makes them feel like they're part of the game. The best example I have is, is uh, the Seattle Seahawks. They have this whole thing about the 12th, uh, the 12th man, and that's the fan. Uh, there's 11 players on the field. The 12th man is actually is the fan. So they really celebrate the fan, and that's paid off for them. Um, and the most important thing for, for consumers is to see sports sponsors that actually support the sport. So how can you as a sponsor, uh, a brand that's involved in sports, actually support it? whether it's giving uh, scholarships to young athletes um, or supporting certain causes that are important uh, for the sport. That's certainly something that fans take note of. So to wrap things up, uh, being a sports fan is about giving uh, as much as you get. Um, and COVID has led fans to give more time, but less money. Although in certainly in areas like merchandise, we're seeing continued popularity. Um, and COVID has definitely changed how people engage, but hopefully coming out of it, we're going to see a different world. So um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our guests. So I'd like to invite our amazing guests uh, to hop on right now, Paul Alexander, Dahani Jones, and Julie Levin. So let's hope they pop up. Dahani, Paul, look at that. Gotta love technology. Thanks so much <laughs> for joining. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to just um, have quick intros and backgrounds uh, from each of you, starting with Julie. Julie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm so I was laughing so hard, and I was so glad my mic was off because I was like, God, there were so many things I was gonna make. A <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna circle back on how much money you're putting on which team for the Super. Bowl. <laughs> um, so I am. I just started a new position as head of sports partnerships at MediaCom that I'm really excited about. But prior to that, I spent about three years with the local Fox Sports broadcast here in Southern California. Um, so I'm, I have so many opinions on the media coverage and consumption around both the Olympics and the Super Bowl that I'm really excited to dive into. And then prior to that, I have a long story background with um, agency. So advertisers themselves and really trying to put their brands right. in the right places in, uh, in culture. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, so, Paul Alexander, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the Questroom School of Business uh, at Boston University. But in former lives, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in packaged goods, uh, ties to the Super Bowl, came with working on the Chunky Soup advertising for seven years. And so that's um, that's why I've got the Eagles uh, helmet right behind me. That was a blast. And then ties to the uh, Olympics uh, came with working for Liberty Mutual Insurance and uh, led the sponsorship for the Olympics and Paralympics as well as FIFA. So I've got my I got my Olympic gear on. I got my <laughs> chunky suit on. And, uh, <laughs> really happy to be here. And as a Boston University alum, I wish you had your uh, Boston University gear on too, because I'm super supportive of that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I've, got, I've only been here seven months. I got. Yeah, I got yeah. some... I'm getting. I'm getting inside peek on how you cast these panels, Matt. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Just so <laughs> happens, everybody's. I'm in my own echo chamber. Uh, 
Dahani, thanks so much. Great seeing you again. For those of you who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, well, number one, um, Paul, I think you were you were working with Donovan with Campbell Soup, right? Right. So uh, I was I was a and part of that. I was, I was, and of course, his mom, who's good friends with my mother, and I was a part of that Super Bowl um, Eagles team that we unfortunately lost. I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I know it's okay. It happens. I was um, there. The, I know. There. I was there. You, you were there. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and and if we had won, maybe I would have been able to gift everybody a, a jersey like Matt's <laughs> wearing of the, the, the yeah. Super Bowl um, Eagles team. So I played football for a long period of time. Loved every single every single minute of it, and then uh, moved into. The world of television i've done a couple different shows of which i've traveled all around the world if you haven't seen will smith's show on nat geo I, I just have to put a plug in because like for my kids to be able to watch will smith on tv explore different edges of the of the universe and the world is tremendous i did it from a sports perspective and then i've done a bunch of other tv's shows since then and then moving to the world of business i've owned a couple different um creative agencies and understand sort of the the world of creativity and the and the world of analytics and you kind of put those whole things together and you know I just love to be an advocate for great people that are doing amazing things like Matt and Susie um, and all the 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 in- insights and information because that's what the world is driven by now right even in the world of world of sports I mean you sit you know you watch any of the coaches on the sideline they're going off data and analytics day in and day out they're yeah. they're not questioning any decisions because they already have the information at their fingertips and our today consumer you know is able to kind of give us those remarkable insights that's going to help us make those data driven decisions and uh, hopefully the Bengals pull it off cuz that was the last team I, I played for so i mean in in this game i do have a dog in the fight um even though the the eagles really did take care of me in, in the the Giants raised me, but I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you know Joe Burrow and his uh his, we'll see what kind of outfit he comes with this time to this game. <laughs> what kind of bling he has on? What kind of bling? <laughs> and, that's, and that's the team I have my money on. So um, <laughs> yeah, so I yeah. Bengals Nation loves the honey. We went to a game a couple of years ago, a Sunday night game against the Steelers, and we were in the parking lot. I, I might as well have showed up there with Elvis. I mean, <laughs> all over this guy. So I know they have a lot of love for you still. So. Um, I'd love to start with Paul. Um, so it's interesting about the Chunky Soup, because that was, to me, was one of the most iconic sports ads ever. And it's just something that so many sports fans remembered. Um, if you were to execute that same campaign today, how would you do it differently, knowing how much sports and fandom has changed? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would do it all that differently, honestly, because what Chunky Soup was, it was the it was the female counter to all the alpha male brands. Yeah, and so mm. you know, the, so that was the insight. Yeah, exactly, and I and I still think that's apropos today, and that's why the the campaign still exists. Um, uh, but uh, but I I still think that insight around uh, appealing to not all ads appealing to the alpha male in us uh, still makes sense, and why that campaign I think will will forever work. Yeah, and I think the insight just behind the athlete's mom, I don't know if you recently saw, I saw it on Twitter a couple of days ago where uh, Kevin Durant's mom kind of went at Stephen A. Smith on Twitter because right. he felt, she thought he wrote something that was unfair and he just responded, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> it was fun. It was the power. You don't mess with the moms, right? right. Well, I, and, I, and I'll tell I'll tell the story super quick. It was Donovan McNabb's mom who got the real moms into the ads. Mm. The, the used actresses. And it was Wilma McNabb who said, I could do that. Right. And, and the creatives wrote her in and the rest is history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amazing. I think the authenticity and the human insight is exactly like when that's right, it's timeless. So yeah. in terms of like the application of it, like there's probably different, you know, ways that you could have amplified that in culture using sure. like the portfolio of social media channels. But you're right. Like that insight is still relevant. So unless like it's a hundred years from now and we're not, we're no longer eating food in the same way, then you're right. It's like, that's, I think that's so interesting. And you wonder like if brands are kind of shortchanging that now and then just trying to get viral and making it like so tactical and sort of neglecting that like really deep understanding of like what makes people tick and what will actually like, make them feel something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's yeah, and I and and Julie, I have to 
think about that in terms of, you know, you know, Matt, you asked Paul if he would do anything different that, you know, you, you, you don't have to do anything different. You just have to create good, good content. And I think people still demand and people still love that. And I think that when people try to make something go viral, it never goes viral. When people make things because they love what it's going to say and what it's going to do and the story that it's going to tell, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter the platforms you, you put that content on, right? So you can put that Campbell's Chunky Soup you know, commercial on Twitter. You can put it on TikTok. You can put it on Instagram. And then all of a sudden I would have my mom sitting out at the table. It would be, it would be <laughs> some type of hashtag, you know, make your mom eat chunky soup or something like that right and then all of a sudden it just kind of it naturally takes on a life of its own because people all of a sudden see that you know that word authenticity of what the brand is trying to bring um in parallel to like what's happening in so much so much more of the market so yeah yeah and i think julie your point about about brands losing the insight is a strong one because you know i spent a lot of time running an ad agency too throughout my career and would start to happen when you saw platforms like Instagram and Snapchat and obviously now TikTok explode is that for some brands, and I think this is a misguided approach, the, the medium became the idea versus the message. Yeah. So what are you doing? Oh, we're doing this big thing on TikTok. It's like, okay, well, what are you doing? I know, exactly. I love yeah. that. <laughs> TikTok isn't an idea, right? And I think that's where it kind of gets lost. And that's where you see bad execution for sure. I mean, that's perfectly said. Cause I mean, like one of the things like, you know, we when we're really successful in in my group um, in creative systems and sports and entertainment partnerships within it and media comms, when we work with the creative agency and all of the other key strategic agents agency, like the, the whole ecosystem to really kind of understand like, OK, so like ultimately, like what are we trying to do here? Who are we talking to? How do we want to engage them? What's like a real truth? How do we tell a great story? And then based on like the insights of where people actually consume media that they're trying to talk, that's when we can start to have fun and be creative with the context, Yep. you know, but the content itself still has to be right. And like, so I, it's, I've been, of course, like, you know, looking at all the Super Bowl ads, which now it's like every year it's like, you know how like they start advertising like Easter and like December. <laughs> Every year it just seems to get like so much sooner. I kind of feel that way with like Super Bowl ads. Like they, ne you never saw a Super Bowl ad like when I was coming of age in this business until the Super Bowl. Right. But now it's like you get all the previews and it used to be like a week out, but it's like two weeks now. It's like a month. But I was watching this one Amazon ad today with Scarlett Johansson and Colin uh, is a jost. His, sure. yeah. And it was actually really interesting because it was a super insight about like, people's fears about technology and how responsive Alexa is, but like, does it read your mind? And then the scary things that can happen if technology mm. becomes too smart. And they did like a really fun, playful execution that I think will go over really well, but it was really great insight. And I was so impressed. And of all of the ads that I've seen so far, I'm like, okay, like I right. think that, and then I could start to see how fun that could get on like, Twitter and the, you know, the entire sort of social media world of wonders that we have. But it was like yeah. the first one that I've seen out of like the plethora of fun, engaging ads that really seem to be like, wow, that's like a real like truth. That's something that everyone's going to feel. And it's Very like cool. irrespective of like Gen Z, Gen X, millennial, like which I really right. liked. Yeah. Yeah. Donnie, we, I brought up during the presentation just the point that fans are shifting away from just being a fan of the jersey to being a fan of the player or even, <laughs> even less so a fan of whoever there is on their fantasy team or who they bet on the night. As a former athlete, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's good or bad for the sport? Well, I love all my fans. I right. will tell you that. Um, I and I appreciate everybody always supporting yeah. me. And, and I, I want to also make note that I brought my snowboard in the background you know, I didn't necessarily wear my jersey, even though I should have just been able to send everybody a jersey out there. But I brought my snowboard. And it's actually I won't be circling back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, and for, for a lot of people that don't know, like football wasn't even my primary sport. I started actually snowboarding and I was actually swimming before I I, I played football. And the guy that made this snowboard is uh, Russell Winfield, alongside with a guy named Virgil Abloh. Right. So and I think Virgil and I think Russell um, kind of 
answer that question that you're talking about, Matt, because Virgil went across brands. People were a fan of him as a, as a, as a person. Yeah. And I think that when you're talking about this world of authenticity, it's getting to know the players finally, yeah. right? It's not just the team. And so I respect that. I love that. It's like, come meet me and come hang out with, with me. So I want to get to know you. And I think that's creating an even deeper, more personal relationship Point. with the players. And that's actually making the fans have a greater appreciation and value for the team. And I think, you know, and, and, and Rick A said, rest in peace, virtual Abla. Yes, definitely. I mean, he's an amazing designer, amazing friend. Um, I, I, I think that it's changing the way that people, um, value value the team they're changing the way that they value value the person i think that the 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 teams are respecting that for a long time the teams didn't understand the value of that a, a kyler murray or that a, a russell wilson or that a joe burrow could bring to the team they looked at it and they said okay how much can the team you know add value to the team and so they would never inherently let the player do anything outside of the sport yeah. Right. And I was traveling the world. I was snowboarding and you know, I was taking all kinds of chances on my non-guaranteed contract because I just wanted to see what was up. You know right. what I mean? Right. Um, and so now that allows flexibility. So I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I mean, I think, don't you think though, like there's always been like those franchise players that um, they're, they're so iconically associated with a team, but there's so much love from their city that the city will support them. So like, let's go back to Joe Montana. Like he went to the chiefs. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think people from San Francisco didn't want Joe Montana to do well. And I think right. that's what happened with Tom Brady. I mean, those guys are iconic and they like both embody and transcend their geography. If that mm. makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're forever. Like, you know, I, I would think that like, um, Joe Montana would be buried in a in a 49ers jersey and not a Chiefs jersey. And then ultimately like a Patriots jersey for Tom Brady. I mean, I've always hated him, um, but I respect him. And like, I love that he went and won a Super Bowl with another team. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's, 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 so I think it's like there's certain players that have always had that cachet and that ability. Right. You know, I also think that the broadcasting world has changed. I, I, I remember growing up, I can only watch the hometown TV team. Right. You didn't have Twitter to your point to So you didn't really get to know athletes, especially from out of town teams, how it, you couldn't access them. You couldn't hear from them. You couldn't access even their highlights until sports center came on and became mm -hmm. popular. So the world's changed so much. So a lot of those traditional, I guess, values of fandom have certainly shifted. So let's switch gears a little bit towards the Olympics. I see the, you know, the Olympic rings on your, on your, um, on your shirt, Paul, like what are your thoughts on the Olympics? And, you know, if you were in charge of reinvigorating fandom for the Olympics, what would you do given some of the struggles they've had um, over the last couple of games? I, I think somebody said it before. It's, it's all about the, the stars yeah. and, and the individual stories. And I think, you know, unfortunately, the winter games always are a, you know, kissing cousin to the summer games. I mean, yeah. people don't know that the U S sends a third of the athletes to the winter games, like 200 mm. and they sent 600 to the summer games. I mean, it's just a different animal and the, the, the winter games just take so long to get going. And it's in this geography a zillion years away. And even NBC, I think they spend much more time with, um, with the summer games athletes and telling their stories than they do the winter, yeah. winter games. So, I mean, if, if there was one thing I could do, if, if the winter if the winter Olympic athletes didn't all have to wear helmets or something that covers their head, I think I think it would change things because I think any sport where you have to wear something and it, it dehumanizes you. It just yeah. it does it's not the same as running track or swimming or Michael Phelps or um, it, so that I mean it's it's just I think the winter Olympic Winter Olympics are always just tough. Yeah. Tough. Right. To but that being said, the Summer Olympics really struggled in viewership too. May have been COVID related and the timing, but you know, it's it's interesting. I think, that, Go on, I think this is like this is such a challenging issue because Matt, you said it. It's a big global like event, right? Like the Super Bowl is a national event. This is a global event. And think about the state of the world right now is like so strife 
advertisers are really challenged with the Olympics to like make the right move because it's taking place in Beijing and there's so many like social and human issues that are at hand, politically speaking. And it's really tough to win. And when you think about like what makes it great in like this, in any sort of national professional sport or even college level, you have like sponsors that take an entire league, right? And they, they help to like tell the stories, not only of the sport, but of the individual players. They have player deals, they have league deals, they have team deals. And it's really hard to do that with the Olympics because mm -hmm. of the challenges and blowback that they're going to face. I mean, like I, I kept going on Twitter, like while you were going through your presentation and I was like, it is so negative. And um, negative in what way? In terms of the coverage, in terms of like um, why we're even there. <laughs> I mean, you had the entire US hockey pull out right before, and it was COVID, but there's it's just it's just so difficult to wrap your arms around it. And I think like you can sort of like build a barrier and protect the Super Bowl. And just like forget about COVID for a minute because people right. are so psyched about the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you have so much commercial power to help you amplify the event. Like it is as much like a sporting event as 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 it is a commercial event. Yeah. So like all this lead up with the with you know the advertisers is just makes it just as exciting. And the halftime right. show, it's the spectacle of it. And like we really can't control the Olympics in that same way. Yeah. Mm. But Julie, I would wonder how people will respond, you know, when Sean White gets out there, right? right. To Paul's point, you know, That's you're talking different. about you're talking about the athletes, you're talking about yeah. someone that has You're talking main, about a five time main, main Olympian street, like Main Street stardom. I mean, yeah. you know, he's he's out there. They know he's gonna retire. The the ratings are yeah. gonna just jump during that one moment. And I think that, you know, if you go back to the story aspect of it, you start building these building these characters the story. without their helmet. On to people see their face. They're not necessarily. A, a, they're not necessarily. They're, everybody's married to uh, the United States, but they're more married to the characters and the participants, and want to get to know what where they've been and what they're doing. Um, but then also, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Olympics ratings as soon as the Super Bowl goes off, and then they switch right to the you know switch to the Olympics. Right? I think there. I think last it was like twenty million. 20 million viewers and it'll kind of get a, a bump and, you know, and Mike Tirico is working between the two, between Olympics and also work on the Super Bowl. So this is kind of a, like a unique year yeah, to kind of sure. see what will actually happen with the ratings at that moment in time. Yeah. Because the Super Bowl, for those of you who don't know, is, is a week later than it normally is. It's never been this late in the February yeah. uh, because the NFL added another game to its schedule. Um, yeah. Major changes in NFL this year going from 16 games to 17 games, as well as expanding the pool of teams that are in the playoffs um, from 12 to 14. So both of those things obviously made it much more lucrative for the networks who see the value of broadcast mm -hmm. television, um, as well as extended the season. So that's why yeah. we have the overlap with the Olympics, which is interesting. Um, let's talk about, with the time we have left, just where sports is going um, when you look at things like um, talk about Tom Brady a lot, like the NFT, you know, he just got beyond a new NFT uh, platform that's going to mm -hmm. allow um, athletes to monetize, um, you know, their name and likeness. Obviously, major changes in the NCAA with, uh, you know, athletes being able to monetize their uh, name and, and, and likeness. And uh, it was just announced that Fanatics, who's the, the big apparel company, um, is now allowing college athletes um, to actually sell their jerseys while they're in college, which I think is amazing, right? But that's going to be another um, huge boon. Um, so between, uh, you know, and then the collectibles market is hotter than ever before, uh, whether it's, you know, graded baseball cards or autographs or things like that. Um, so there's just so many ancillary opportunities and the biggest of which I think still being betting and game, gaming uh, for better or worse in esports, right? So all these different areas where sports <laughs> are going to, do we, it, are all these changes going to be a good thing for sports and, and fandom? And um, what do you think some of the big opportunities are for brands to be looking at? So when we start with Paul for that. Um, I, you know, I was thinking back on the Olympics answer. I think an opportunity is uh, going back to hyper locality. And what I mean by that is when I worked with the Olympics, nothing was more inspiring 
than these young people's stories and yeah. what they did to get to where they are. Yep. So I think, you know, being able to, to now monetize that for themselves, I mean, you know, we sh there should be a story about every one of these kids and where they came from and how they got to the Olympics and what happened when they got back, whether they won or, or not. And so I think that I think there's a hyper local story to 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 be to be had there, especially with now their ability to monetize themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I did a lot of work with Visa on their Olympic activation um, in London, and a big part of what we did, which was incredibly successful, is focusing on athlete stories because mm -hmm. it's that human connection. Paul, you're talking about the sports that don't have the helmets on people. Well, telling the story of how they got there. Some of these stories of these Olympians is just incredible. It really just draw you in. It creates a human connection. And ultimately, that's what sports is about. It's about stories, right? Um, people watch reality TV because it's about stories. Well, this is the real life version of that. And the blood sweat. Yeah, the real life reality TV. Exactly. It really is. <laughs> the actual right? unscripted media. Yeah. So true. So I think, that's, I, I think that's a big opportunity for brands is how do you uncover the stories beyond the athletes? And I think there's no shortage of platforms to be able to tell those stories in meaningful ways. Yeah. So I think that that's huge. Dahani, what do you see as some big opportunities in, in the sports world? Well, I don't know if I know what the biggest opportunity. I mean, obviously, the metaverse is going to play a, a, an interesting role as you're starting to see some competitions take place in this yeah. new, unique wide world that we have no idea where it is except for when we put our goggles on right yeah um so there's there's that and it's very real i think more about the challenge that will will be faced with team sports versus individualized sports and what i mean by that is when you have that name image and likeness uh start to sort of push its way to the top there's a lot of players that are going to be in college that are going to be making one to two million dollars a year on these college teams, how long are they actually going to stay a part of their team in their amateur status? And I put quotation marks because amateur is being challenged now. Sure so is. what what will what will that mean? Um, and then when I think about you know individuality as a subject when it comes to playing on the on the Eagles or playing on the Bengals or you know or playing on the Giants, you know. Yes, there was that one name player that was the standout person that everybody knew was the iconic figure. Now everybody is a standout player, an iconic figure. So now we, we've got 11 people on the field and everybody's vying for everybody's attention, trying to figure out how they can get the best deal and how they can be sort of like the, the, the face of the organization. Everybody can't be, or can they, right? So that push-pull... I'm interesting to I'm interested to see how that plays out in the future. Whether that. it's a big opportunity yeah. or not, I just think that the team dynamic is going to be not what it was before. And, and you can just sum it by saying, you know, will anybody have humility in the future? I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah, a great <laughs> point. I mean, if you look at almost like even in the sports broadcast world, Bill Simmons, right? He was fired from ESPN. Um, unceremoniously, and then he just went and he created his own podcast network. Uh, the and Ring it's awesome. and, yeah, Spotify acquired it, but he was incredibly successful. People followed him versus mm -hmm. the network. Um, you're seeing that come through in, in all media, um, where you in you know in in all forms, people following the journalists versus the networks. This is really no different. People are following the athletes, and and since you have access to the athletes, and I think you raise a great point, Dahani, in that now they're able to do so at an earlier age. So now mm -hmm. these these there's no more amateur, and these individual college athletes can start building their brands earlier in their career. I'm sure you would have loved to have been able to monetize your jersey when you were at Michigan, right? I'm sure you could have used the money mm -hmm. before you you know got into the NFL, and it's, I think it's great that now at least the athletes can do that. Mm -hmm. I think it also opens up opportunities in the financial, you know, financial space where now it's it's a, it's an opportunity. It's also a challenge. Right. Players are going to start making money. When are they going to need their team of people to take care of their assets yeah. as they move through well, the collegial like level? And don't forget, look, Julie, it's going to trickle down into the high school world, too. Yeah, and no, but it already is. Real scary. So there's a there's a in the NBA there. Well, I should say in the basketball world, there is um, an organization called Overtime, and they're taking yep. athletes out of high school and they're literally competing, essentially in a professional format. And their curriculum also 
is organized around learning how to um, be like a professional famous athlete and the money and the challenges that go along with that. Just, I just wanted to make a point because we Please. keep talking about story here. So I think this is a big opportunity for media, not just like advertisers and not just people. So I think as I'm watching the Olympics, because I really tried <laughs> and I happen to always have loved the Olympics. Um, I, what I'm lacking and what I really learned in my time with Fox is how critical it is for you to have the kind of production folks on the ground that like understand how to build a story in real time. Yeah. Okay. And it's like really hard to do. These people are geniuses, but they exist. And the big networks did it better forever than anybody else. Um, and nobody was better at it than like, but I, Rooney, I can't even think of his name. He was like Bob Iger's mentor. And then of course, like Bob Iger, like cut his teeth and really learned about the power of storytelling as a sports producer at ABC. And I think like, to me, I'm like, that's totally missing. So there's the individual stories within and it's building, it's building the suspense and the excitement. And um, I don't care if it's Amazon, I don't care if it's Google or Facebook. I think like, it's not just about getting eyeballs. You have to keep the eyeballs engaged. And we're like, we have no attention spans. I put myself in that. Like, I can't even watch anything without two different devices in front of me, which is the gamification of everything. But I still think if when I when I'm really compelled by a story, I will drop everything, especially with sports. And you know, I'm obviously a fanatic and I'm team loyal. The other thing is just on the individual athlete versus the team. Your story is almost nothing without your team story. So it's that friction point of trying to build your narrative within the context of a team. And that's if you play a team sport. It's obviously different if you're Serena Williams right. and, um, you know, and or something, even somebody on the PGA tour. And obviously there's different types of sports there's individual versus team but i'm a big believer in like the individual athletes that are most admired who come from team sports are the ones that like kind of build up their team and like they like that's what joe burrows is doing great insight so on mean? that note, narrative right now is how two, in, two years yeah. I, I, I think that the, the, I agree on a juxtaposition of those two things and even joe burrow you you probably see he wears a lsu uh wristband when he's on the field. Yeah. So him, his team. And he brought his guy with him. He yeah. convinced them to draft him. So it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it, he knows it's not just about him, even though he has, you know, he's, he's lacking a lot of resources and he's still getting it done. Absolutely. But um, yeah, I do think it's incumbent upon like the broadcast media, whether it's streaming, um, social, whether it's pieces of things and it's fast snackable content or the gestalt of the story, like, we need better storytelling That's great. and then everybody needs to support the storytelling ecosystem or you're just going to lose everybody. No one's really yeah. going to care or have any passion. So to wrap it up, because we only have one minute left, um, I'd love to just go around and get some Super Bowl predictions uh, to, to wrap it up. This is being filmed, so we'll see who was right. And whoever <laughs> was right is going to get assigned the Honey Jersey Eagles jersey. Um, the Honey Jones Eagles jersey. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with, uh, with Paul. Paul, uh, score of the game. I'm going 27-20 Cincinnati. Wow. Julie. I mean, the Rams aren't going to make it super high scoring. <laughs> I, it might be a little different with Stafford. I, okay. I'm going to go Bengals, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say 30-23. 30, 23 Bengals. The honey. I'm going the same thing as Julie. Um, Bengals, 30, Rams, 24, though. Okay. okay. I think that the Rams are going to kind of lay a little bit of a, of a beat down on Sunday. 34, 17 Rams. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. You're still strong, Matt. I just yeah. think that like this scrappy Joe Burrow <laughs> and his team, man. Well, we I don't won't know. Pay. Well, I want to thank all you guys for joining. Paul, Julie, Dahani was really amazing. Um, we will be sharing recording of this so we could all share it out. And uh, your insights were incredibly valuable to us in our audience. So thanks again. We'll have to do it again next year uh, before the big game. So on behalf of myself 
and our great team at Suzy and our established panel. Thanks so much. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Take care. Happy Black History Month. Yes.